Welcome to the latest edition of Broadcasting Today. You'll see there's a piano here today. That's because it's got a musical theme. We've got the world-renowned piano virtuoso Julian Joseph coming to share his experience and some of his musicality. All part of our mission here at Middlesex University London to teach students how to think, but also how to do. As you'll notice today, it's a slightly different format. We've got uh, a piano in the studio. And that's because we've got a musical theme. A musical theme with a musical maestro, Julian Joseph. Julian, it's fantastic to have you here. You know what? It's been my fantasy for about 20 years to be on stage with you. Uh, because I can't play an instrument and my voice is lousy, um, I've finally, finally managed to achieve that. Well, it's been an ambition of mine too. <laughs> Although we have been on stage together before. It is true. At the Royal Albert Hall. In truth, did we were. Performing. We weren't performing. We weren't performing. But uh, we did speak. Tell me, the piano. Mm -hmm. Where did that begin? Well, I, I guess somewhere in, in my consciousness or subconscious, it was sort of bubbling up. But, but when it actually took form was... Um, my mum bought a piano. I was away at, at uh, school one day and came back and saw the piano in the front room. So, of course, myself and my two brothers, we came back from school and we were like, Mum, there's a piano in the front room. She's like, yep, and you're all going to learn. And that's really where it came in. So and then it became a passion. When your mother put the piano there, she, did she also put the jazz book in front or did you grow into jazz, was it? Uh, there was no jazz book. It was no jazz book. It was all. Um, it was all just. I, I guess the the culture of learning piano, especially in the early seventies, um, it's it was all classical music. So, um, and really, the the whole point of learning the piano or learning an instrument was to sort of acclimatize to a culture of understanding great music. And great music was just. Um, appreciated or known to be classical music. So I had my first teacher who would have these different kinds of books that had simplified versions of great classical works and you'd just learn those. And uh, so that's really how, how the, the, the concrete music learning started. Wh where did the passion for jazz, where did that come from? Well, the passion for jazz is a completely separate thing. I think um, I think I was just always attracted to whatever the sound of jazz, whatever the quality of jazz is, um, whatever the hallmarks of jazz is, and uh, you know, maybe I'll list them. But in in my estimation, analyzing my childhood, I was always drawn to that element in whatever music I heard, and uh, amongst jazz musicians we often respond very um, favorably to rich harmonic texture. So if I'd hear rich harmonic texture in anything, whether it was a television theme tune, whether it was a piece of classical music, i.e. from the Russian school or the French school, then you know, I, something was drawing me to it. But then when I heard jazz, what I understood to be jazz, be it, be it the music of Duke Ellington or Oscar Peterson, um, there seemed to be abundance of that sound going on there, packed into this wonderful sense of groove that, that you know, I soon found out was called swinging. Um, and uh, to describe the rhythmic impetus that's created in jazz. So I was attracted to that too. But you gravitated towards it very young. Yes. I mean, you say... It took a while, but you did actually gravitate towards that very young. Yeah, absolutely. I gravitated towards it. It was just there. I could... Um, whatever it is that, that it is just attracted me. I just loved the, the sound of it, the vibe of it. But um, I guess when I came into musical consciousness, or I, when I was maybe around nine or ten, and... Um, I, I was fascinated by these musicians who could make things up and it had a certain cohesion to it, to it. 
Of course, I wasn't using words like that at nine or ten, but <laughs> I, was, I was attracted to that. It was like musical magic, in a way, that, that made me feel very good. I can remember, about the age of ten, being given a copy of, original copy, mm -hmm. by a neighbour who was moving, mm -hmm. Porgy and Bess. Right. With, you know, the original version of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on vinyl right. and I smelt it and I looked at it and I, <laughs> I, I played it and I played it over and over and right. over and over again. For Jet, for me, that's where jazz began right. at the age of 10 with that single album. Yeah. Was there something like that for you too? Uh, I mean, I think similarly I was familiar with the music of Porgy and Bess. Whether I knew it came from Porgy mm. and Bess or not, I'm not sure, but um, I think you know, I think probably I was listening to an album of Miles, <coughs> Miles Davis's called Milestones. Mm. And for me, that's always, that sound has always been the central sound of jazz for me. Also, growing up seeing Oscar Peterson on television, um, the way he played and, and the bands that he had, and all of the people he interacted with, that spoke to me of what jazz was. But to be honest, I was aware of jazz and I was always attracted to whatever had jazz in it. So, and in those days, there was quite a few things. You'd see movies that would feature Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra and they would be with Louis Armstrong. And so I was really into that. But I guess my first attempts at improvising came from trying to play Summertime, you know. And I discovered uh, this, I discovered a seventh chord, which is uh, in a scale, you've got seven notes and then it repeats over again. So if I, if I play a G, ma a G major scale, then it repeats again, right? And so I'd, what I'd do is I'd experiment with the intervals and I found this, the, the flat seven, uh, my, my nine, ten-year-old ear said, that's a jazz chord. <laughs> and so I just fooled around and I started, uh, you know, playing. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, I didn't put those extensions on it immediately. <laughs> but um, that, that interval started my experiment in, in, in one, figuring out a tune that I wasn't looking at uh, that was written out, where I was using my ear and trying to engage with this thing <coughs> that I knew in an abstract way was a jazz sensibility. So much so that when I figured out the tune, I ran into the dining room and I said, Mom, I can play jazz. <laughs> you know, little did I know, I'm, you know, many years later, I'm still trying to play jazz. But the inspiration was there, obviously, from young. So y your first influence is you, you've chosen a number which you want to illustrate that, if you like. Just yeah. Well, I thought, I was wondering, what, what could I play to, to show where I was coming from? Now, in my household, my mum was really into the music of Handel, Liszt, Bach, the, the Beethoven, the, the stalwart central cats of classical music. <coughs> so she, she was really into that and would listen to, to Handel's Messiah, uh, Beethoven's symphonies. Um, and my dad was really into rhythm and blues uh, and had his own band. So um, he, he was uh, the, the music of Otis Redding and, and so on and so forth. And so one of the earliest people that I really got into was a, was a fantastic a pianist from Chicago called, uh, called Ramsey Lewis. And so I then, uh, I then started to listen to, to his music and try and work out some of his solos. And when I made my first record, um, I had a kind of R&B bluesy influence to, to one of the opening, well, to the opening track of the album, which I called Miss Simmons. So I thought I might just play that for you. And you can see whether or not it reflects any of that, but I thought it might be nice to play. <laughs>
course, you got to a certain point in your musical education mm. where you said, it's not quite going to do it for me here. I need to go to the land of jazz. And you decided to set off for the United States mm -hmm. at 18 or 19, wasn't mm -hmm. it? What made you make that decision? And how did that transform your world view of what your possibilities were? I think I'd always had a desire to go to the States, to go to the home of jazz. Where was jazz born? So it was born in the city of New Orleans, um, migrated throughout the country <coughs> so that uh, many cities have an expression of jazz. But uh, the educational hub of America, not only for jazz, but for sciences, for all kinds of things, is Boston, Massachusetts. And they had, uh, in the, in that, at that time, which is the mid-'80s, um, a long-running jazz program um, at the Berklee College of Music. So I thought, well, I'll go there if I can get there. So I made various inroads to finding out what it would take to go over there. Uh, sent a tape as well and was lucky enough to be offered a scholarship, which I didn't have to accept. Um, and I say that, uh, it, you know, at a time when education in this country is, uh, you know, very different from, from when I was a child. And we had something in London called the Inner London Education Authority. <laughs> and <clears throat> Fond memories. Fond memories. <laughs> <laughs> and they supported my going to, my further education. Um, I had to go and audition and, and get, get what was called an award, um, where they would support my education for m my whole undergraduate education for the time I was in Berkeley. And uh, so that meant that pretty much everything got taken care of. And thanks to my mother, she's the one who kind of negotiated that, checked all of that out, because the natural route is, well, you know, can't you just learn somewhere here and, and just get on with it here? And um, in those days, not really. There was only uh, Leeds College of Music, which had a light music course. And, um, and you know, being a jazzer, I didn't want to go somewhere where I'd learn light music. It was not what I was into. So. Um, Thankfully, from the support of this country and the Inner London Education Authority and my mum, I went to Berkeley, and uh, it was, I, I had a really, uh, it was a, a culture shock for me. It was a rounded education. Very different. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very, it was a very different experience, because I'd never left home. You know, I was uh, 19 years old, and, you know, green. I was a, a, an immature 19. Um, I thought I was much more mature than I was, but, but I, I found out that you know my worldview, my whole take on things, you know, looking after myself. I didn't know how to look after myself. I was, you know, raised by, you know. You went to uh, America, uh -huh. came back, and now you're a broadcaster, uh -huh. composer, yeah. virtual penis. Mm -hmm. How do you juggle all these things? Um, well, you know, the thing is. Uh, I, d I don't really feel that I'm juggling anything because everything emerged from the source. I was, you know, I do my, I deal with my music. You know, for my friends who know me well, I write all the time. I'm constantly composing. So generally I'll always play an original composition because I'm always writing something. Um, so that, you know, that takes up a lot of my time. But Often on my uh, shows and when I talk to people, having read so much about music and, and just being an, a very interested student, the broadcasting emerged from that. And uh, I, I was called many, much, many times to, to talk about various artists when I was very young in, in the music and just started my career. And eventually that evolved into becoming a broadcaster. And I still find it quite, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, Kurt's a broadcaster and journalist. And understanding myself as a, as not necessarily a journalist, but as a broadcaster, um, accepting that image of myself took a of quite a few years, actually. So. I don't necessarily feel I ha had to juggle it, but I certainly had to get used to the idea that, 
that I was a broadcaster. Um, Do you consider yourself a teacher now as well as part of your responsibility? You run the academy, yeah. you're going to play with a couple of students right yeah. now. You see that as part of your, important well, part of your, um, the way you prosecute your, your music? Yeah, well, I, th I think it's always been a, a strong part, a strong part of what I've always done. It's become culturally the thing you do in jazz. Um, uh, more so, because it always was. It w uh, you know, when I, I was uh, in my mid-teens, I was very fortunate to, to study and to go to a workshop that was run by the great uh, British trumpeter and composer Ian Carr. And his mentorship taught me so much about the professionalism of being a musician, because he was like, well, Julian, you know, I went to university and I studied English study literature and you know you must find some other things that that interest you and um, you know he was a very serious man he was a very bright man and um, he just he he was always thinking as an artist and I think that really influenced me a lot and he, he said something really important to me actually uh, when I was 16 he said it to all of us myself a great flautist called Philip Bent um, Mark Mondesi, who's a fantastic drummer, who I've been working with for 30 years. Um, it's even hard to imagine that, 30 years. I've known Mark for 30 years. Uh, he said to us, he said, look, look at the people around you, because these are the people you're going to be playing with for the rest of your life. Yeah. So be nice to them. Well, I, I <laughs> thought there was, I had two thoughts. I thought, well, is this it? You know, or... What is he actually saying? And, you know, in the fullness of time, he's been absolutely correct because the major um, hallmarks and the major, uh, the major musical moments in my career have all been made with many of those people who were in that room with us. Mm. And, you know, you travel this world in, uh, and this musical journey together and it, it, it means you're developing something in a, you know, with like minds and people whose culture is tied up with yours. Well, let's bring David and Tom on. All right, let's do that.
So, Julian, you've played with um, many reputable people. You've just played with Dave and Tom. There you go. Who, uh, <laughs> <laughs> remarkable. Is there anyone out there who you still wish to work with? There are many people who I'd love to work with. Um, but, you know, the, the desire to work <laughs> with specific people um, that I had when I was in my 20s and 30s has, you know, turned into something else, really. I just, because so much of the time I create motors, most of the situations that I play in. So I, my ambitions to work with people are usually to uh, help assist something that I have in, in my mind to create. So, for example, opera, yeah. challenging the idiom yeah. as we know it, mm -hmm. is that, so it's more the challenge of collaborating with others to create that new space, is that it, pushing, pushing the idiom on? Well, certainly to challenge myself, certainly to challenge the idiom, yes. Um, to, to, probably not the idiom, but to challenge the perception of the idiom mm -hmm. um, from people outside of the idiom, maybe some inside, but um, yeah, just try to combine all of the forces that make jazz so visceral and so important to my musical vision and uh, to, to create um, ways of presenting that. So through um, finding a narrative. Um, and I ask myself the question, you know, I'm very interested in, in storytelling. How can I do that in music? The, the first thing you come to is either musicals um, and opera. And, you know, the music is so important and so revered in opera, especially. And I thought maybe if I could try and find some kind of equivalent um, sound in jazz that, that, that I can work on over the years and see if I can, I can try and achieve something that, that gets, gets to, to what I'm thinking about. But it makes you quite a controversial figure, doesn't it, mm. in some ways, in jazz? That right. actually you don't want to ply the same furrow as others, that you want to take it off in a different direction. Well, it's not that I, it's, it's quite a lot of resistance to that. It's not that I don't want to, to do what is traditionally the, the line, because I certainly do. And, and you have to, you know, play in bands and tour and, <coughs> and, and create in, interesting situations that help your music to grow. But I think a, another part of what I'm envisaging is that, you know, I'm a huge fan of the music. I'm a huge fan of the achievements of, of uh, Charles Mingus and Wayne Shorter and um, Carla Blay and uh, Gil Evans and Duke Ellington and Count Basie. And, and I think there are so many aspects, and, and Coltrane, and there are so many aspects in their music that I'd like to bring to the dramatic table, so to speak, that shows the broad range of, of what can be expressed dramatically in a narrative through jazz. So I don't think it's particularly controversial or mind-blowing, <laughs> but it's just that not many people are thinking about doing that or, or thinking about developing that arc in the, the jazz universe. So uh, if, there's, if there's, I'm thinking about that and it probably works to my favor that not too many other people are thinking about it, but I certainly wouldn't mind if other people were thinking about that and, and, and trying to do that too. This next number you were going to play for us. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, that. The next piece I'm playing for you is um, a piece of music that I dedicate to a, a fantastic piano player called Kenny Kirkland. Mm. Um, this piece is called Doc Tone, and it rem represents so many aspects of my artistic um, life because there are influences, great players who I love and, you know, just try my best when I'm practicing to, to come up to their standards and I'm still just trying to, to gather these things. But also, um, one of my first, one of the first arrangements that I wrote in, in the Big Bang setting that I was 
happy with, you know, is related to this tune. Um, it's a, it's, I don't think it's a signature tune for the big band, my, my big band music, but it sort of speaks of, of me thinking in, in a larger scale and yet retaining the small scale groove jazz quality that I like about this music and I like about this particular artist. So th this is a piece called Doctor.
this final piece of music you're going to play solo. Yeah. Tell us about this piece of music and where this is on your own journey. Um, oh, well, the, 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 this, this, this piece is, I'm playing this solo. I thought I was doing oh, you're gonna the, play the blues. With, okay. Well, oh, no, 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 I'll do well, another one. Yes, please. I can't even remember. See, man, I, t I told him I was going to do these tunes. I was explaining. I was explaining to Kurt that he said, "What tunes are you going to play? What are important tunes for you?" <laughs> and I and I said to him, "I said, well, I just chose a bunch of tunes that I knew were related to certain things in my life." And um, and I, but I was explaining to to Kurt when we were talking earlier that it always changes. One minute is this tune, the next minute is another one, and everything is linked to everything else. So. Um, I know what I'm going to play. I'm going to play a piece of music that I composed recently um, when I was thinking about my mother who passed away three years ago. And, um, I, you know, my mum was incredibly important to my artistic life. Now, everyone's mum is important to their life, okay? I get that. <laughs> right? But she was a, a, a great filter uh, for me and a, a great sounding board. Um, and often some of the things that I was thinking about, you hear these stories, Herbie Hancock's just brought out this book. I know I'm really long-winded and I'm going a long way about telling this story, but Herbie Hancock has brought out this book called Possibilities and he talks about Miles Davis saying quite cryptic things to him that unlocked um, portions of his imagination to make his playing evolve and make his thinking about his playing evolve. And I can say that I've never had to travel away from my family. <laughs> I mean, I traveled away, but I've always used my mother and my brothers as sounding boards. Um, James to, is here, in fact. Yeah, James is here, my, my brother, <laughs> James, and one of my brothers, my youngest brother. And um, I call James my other brain, but that's another story. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've always used uh, my family as a sounding board, and my mother in particular. She often opened up little vistas of, of my thinking that made me actually have to deal with some of the things that I was thinking artistically. And so I was thinking about her recently, and I wrote this piece of music, which I called HTB. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
they say the mark of a great talent is a man who, and woman who can think on their feet. <laughs> and you certainly did that with HTB. I'm sure, Junior, you're going to stay around and let people ask you some questions. Sure. But for the purposes of our broadcast, yeah. we want to get the players back on to play us out with a, a nice blues number. Yeah. So if we can get um, Tom and David back on. Uh, I, I feel my soul, I don't about the rest of you, but I feel my soul has somehow been a bit replenished this evening. <laughs> and I go home with a, a real spring in my step. Oh, good, uh, good. So let's give Julie another round of applause. <laughs> and you're going to play us out with... I'm going to play a piece by the great... Hampton Hawes, and it's called Forest Blues.
Julian, thank you so much for coming out to Minnesota. It's a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It's a pleasure. <laughs>